lecture series. I can't believe it's just rolling by. Thank you all for being here. It's a smaller crowd than last week, so we can kind of spread out and relax a little bit. It was kind of crowded last week. So today we welcome Stephen Smith, and he will be talking to us about Enrique, Enrique's College, 1619, America's first college revived. Mr. Smith is an educational entrepreneur. He has worked innovatively in three ways with colleges, through the faculty, continuing education, and seminars. While he is a historical interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg in Jamestown Island, Mr. Smith has rescued from archival obscurity 3,000 plus pages of Virginia Company records from 1606 to 1624. He revived America's first college and has now won 17 history-correcting legislative acts in both Virginia and South Carolina, including a Virginia public school law. He does talks, walks, cruises, reprints, and consults. So you're in for a treat today. Welcome, Stephen. Okay, we got it. Obviously, I'm a tech insufficient here. We uh, have a handout for everybody. I know I put them by the back door, but I notice most people don't have them. If somebody would slip back there, I got them on all three tables, three rows there. Just bring them up and give one to everybody because I want to follow through that as the program itself for you to look at stuff when we're talking about it. The little choir looks like this. If we call it the uh, college, Henricus College 1619, and we put the date in our name on purpose because that's half the story of the college, is how early it was founded. And that's uh, before the pilgrims even left Holland to come over here and found America, we already had a college going up on the James River. Um, Henricus is Latin for Henry. King James had three children, a daughter of Elizabeth, named after Queen Elizabeth, a son named Henry, the heir apparent, Cape Henry down at the beach, Henrico County, the city of Henricus right up the river here, Henricus College was adjacent to the city, and uh, Henrico is an anglicized version of the Latin Henricus. Set up 1619. They hardly even knew how to live over here from the English I'm talking about, and they were already setting up a college. Now that's a remarkable story all by itself. Is that what you'd do if you went to a wilderness place? First thing you'd about to do would be to set up a college. Well, they obviously had a very high notion of education and uh, put it very central to the story here. And I was working at Jamestown, and I'll get back, let me, let me I'm getting ahead of myself. We, I want to do this right at the beginning. One of the things the college does is write up stuff that's important that nobody's been paying attention to, and we send it up to the General Assembly and ask them, would you agree with what we're saying about Jamestown and Henriquez and Plymouth, or whatever we're talking about? And uh, so far, they've said yes every time we've done that and issued a commending resolution for both houses and uh, say we, we commend Henricus College for calling attention to this or that or the other. We've got copies of some of those on our book table over here. Uh, the most recent one was this General Assembly that just was in January and February. Um, last fall, Henricus College organized and conducted a history cruise from City Point Marina here at Hopewell down to Berkeley Plantation 
to be part of their annual Thanksgiving event. And they celebrate that and they're proud of the fact that that was the first official annual Thanksgiving was here, not in Plymouth. So there's a little bit of that rivalry that goes on. Um, and we call attention to that. We agree with that. The record shows that that's true. So we got this cruise and we used the boat from uh, uh, the James River Alliance with their captain and crew and went from here down to the Westover actually, which has a dock. So we got off at Westover and uh, got commuted over to uh, Berkeley and participated in that event, the centerpiece of which is a prayer. That's what the first Thanksgiving consisted of was the prayer. So when we got back, by the way, people asked, why do I go to all this trouble to get a boat and do all this? Because well, I want to get one of those smoked turkey legs down there. That's, that's reason enough for me. So when we got back, I wrote it up, and uh, I asked uh, Carrie Connor, Corner, I mean, excuse me, uh, since she is the delegate from this area, would she sponsor this, or patron it, as they call it. So I sent it up to her, and I sent her copies of some of the other stuff that we've done. We've been through the General Assembly seven times with commending resolutions that agree with us every time, plus state law, which uh, Susan mentioned, for the public schools to teach the Virginia charters. That would involve the governor. Yeah, they had both houses and the governor's son. That's a state law. That's, that's got teeth in it. That was in 1995. So take out your... Uh, uh, flyer, open it up, and look on the inside is a copy of the commending resolution. The first part, about the first half of it is about Berkeley, and most of us don't know the history of Berkeley. Who were these people anyway? They came straight from England, past Jamestown, right up exactly to where they landed, and they established Berkeley. And they knew where they were going. They knew what they were doing. They knew each other. Uh, they had instructions from Barclay Castle. They call it Barclay in England. A uh, big castle that was set up, about the third castle set up in England after the uh, Norman invasion, 1077. And, uh, I mean 1066, I'm sorry. The, uh, so they knew all the history of that tremendous castle, which was set up on the west coast of England to protect the river and the inlets from the west coast that come in there. Bristol is the biggest city there. Wales is a separate little country, sort of, in England, up above and on, looking across the water at Ireland. And they raid England periodically over the centuries. One of the things they did was come down and raid and attack ships and stuff that came in on those western inlets. So uh, very early in the history of the Norman kings and so on that came into England, they put a castle right in the way between Wales and all these little inlets in the city of Bristol. And they called that castle Bark. And they gave the people the responsibility there to guard that, keep the people from raiding, either way without permission. And so I wrote that up a little bit. I got surprised looking at that history, actually. And it was a lot of history, and that meant a whole lot of words, which meant it had to be small to put it in here on one page. So I sort of apologize for the print being small, but I couldn't get any more in there. I would have put more information in there. But this is a sample of, of what we do the type of thing and what it looks like when they do a commending resolution. Whereas this, whereas that, whereas so forth. Um, about just below the middle of the page, right at the middle, I'll read this whereas, and I want you to do something with me right after that. Whereas, one of Captain Woodliff's advisors, Ferdinando Yates, had been, quote, wished by Mr. Thorpe, the cleric, who oversaw work on the upriver campus of the new Henricus College, 
requested by Pocahontas to take a note of every day's travail upon the seas that seamen endure with mercies of Almighty God to support them in all distresses. And the notes are included in the, a famous set of historic records called the Nibley Papers, Smith of Nibley. Um, now the next one, I want y'all to um, read this with me. And then I'm going to do something right after that. All right, let's read this together. Whereas, out loud I mean, whereas upon landing at the site, in awed silence, the men walked to a nearby knoll and, at signal, dropped to their knees as the prayer composing England under the Virginia Company was read aloud. We ordain that the day of our ship's arrival at the place assigned for plantation in the land of Virginia shall be yearly and perpetually keep holy as the day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. That's the first thanksgiving prayer. That's what it consisted of. And there was no feast. There was no family. There was no food. There was no watching the ball game after the <laughs> was over with. Uh, this was a solemn event. This was dangerous to ship to go across the ocean. People didn't know if the ship was going to make it or if they would ever come back again or whatever. So that's what they talk about, the travail on the seas. So when they got here, they had already written this prayer in England. They said, when you land, before you do anything else, you go up ashore and read this prayer. And all the men were in hushed silence. They were awed by their responsibility and that they were going to speak to Almighty God, speak for him and thank him for his blessings by bringing them over here safely. Um, now, when we did this cruise, we invited people at Plymouth to come down here and join us. Uh, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't do that. I, knew, I didn't think they would, but we were prepared to fly one of them down here. Um, but they had their big 400 at the same time that we were doing this cruise. They were in the middle of it, up to their eyeball, trying to do America's first Thanksgiving. Well, this was the third one. Actually, this, that was the 400 of the first, of the first one. They said, and this was our 403rd. So, I, I don't really like to rub it in their face exactly, but I sort of do too. So I know some of those people, and they're good scholars, wonderful people, good Christians. They're just wrong as they can be on that piece of the history. And um, so anyway, I sent this up there, and this prayer is different than the kind of Thanksgiving they do. That's the one, since they won the Civil War, that means they had the right to rewrite history so that it looks good to them and their way. So what I point out to the, to what I call the Plymouth heads, when I'm speaking kindly, um, say that's Yankee Civil War propaganda masquerading as true American history, because it's not accurate. It's just not accurate. And you people know it, you're Christians, you should not be telling something that's not true. Well, they mostly don't know what happened down here. They just say, James helps. He kind of pick it there, but that's a bunch of greedy, no good, whatever, slave driving southern. Nothing good ever came out of Jamestown. So they don't even look at it. And uh, so if, if that's all you see, according to them, it's, it's true. The pilgrims were the heroes of the world. They stepped right off of Noah's Ark right down their cliff. And... Uh, I try to not be sarcastic about that, but I, I do got a little bit of an irritation about it. I hasten to add right here that I'm a descendant of one of the Mayflower people, the physician, Fuller, Samuel Fuller, down to twisting and turning uh, to my father. Uh, I did not know that until a couple of years ago, after I'd long since started doing Henriquez. Uh, I'm also a descendant of John Clay, who was here in 1613, right down the river, next to Flower Do 100. 
next to Jason Dow River. There's a flower dew right on that point there with the Governor Yardley, and then there's Flower Dew Hundred Creek, and then John Clay's property, and then Ward's Creek. And it came all the way back to what's now Route 10. Now that one's easier to follow. My mother's name was Clay, and you could follow her family line all the way down. But she married out of the Clay group, and my dad's name was Smith, so I'm named Smith. Uh, but I didn't know that either. I didn't know any of this genealogy stuff. I didn't care about it. Um, but it, that just helps sometimes when the Plymouth people get mad. I'm in a couple of different groups where they are Plymouth heads, absolutely. And I call them on it every time we meet, and they get mad every time. And they tell me, don't bring that up. I said, well, okay, I'll bring you down. I'll bring you down then, if that's what we do. So but that was my main reason for bringing the college back into existence. Let me finish with this, though. That's the prayer. That's the first Thanksgiving. Uh, and I will call attention to a couple things about the prayer. Did you notice that it's the Almighty God? It does not say Jesus Christ in there anywhere. And yet it's a Christian prayer. How can that be? Well, they had a worldview called the providential. The big worldview of Christian today is evangelical, which is the individual relationship between the person and Jesus. This, this one was 400 years ago. For the first 200 years in America, it was providential. The second 200 years up to now has been evangelical. So when we're today, most of us are evangelical thinking about Think about Christianity, and you go back and you read this stuff for 400 years ago, and they were saying about Jesus, but not only Jesus. They did the rest of the Bible, too. So they felt like this was quite appropriate because they were not winning souls. That was not their purpose. They were all born again already, and they were thanking God Almighty for bringing them over across the ocean. And that's the kind of prayer that you get in providential thinking. So, I want to say something more about that in just a minute. Because that's pretty central to what we do, too. Um, let me ask you to do something with me right now. Take one of your hands and put it above the table, about an inch above the table. Just hold it out there. And you see my little finger up here? When I do like that, Slap your hand out on the table, okay? You ready? All right, that was a pretty good for a beginning. Let's try that again so we can get it all together. Okay, you ready? All right, we're getting there. All right, you ready? Hey! Right. And you see, now that's called preset. You were already set to do something when the stimulus, a stimulus happened. I didn't move my finger, I just hollered. Now, that's a fundamental psychological principle. When you hear the word college, you have a preset about what college is supposed to be. But well, that's not what we are. So I want to point out, you take what you have to, what you know about the college, put it on the shelf. Don't forget it, but just put it on the shelf for a minute and let us talk about who we are. And you can understand, take us on our word, or take them at their word. Take the word that that's a Christian prayer. Uh, there are other phrases and, and concepts that they use the same words we do, but they use them a little bit different. Well, let's finish with this. Then, then, uh, uh, the bottom half of this resolution is about us, the college, taking the cruise to Berkeley. They're commending us for this cruise to Berkeley and calling attention to the first Thanksgiving of Berkeley, both of them. So you can read that there. And I'll say that uh, the providential worldview is very maritime. The two most God-fearing occupations in the world are agriculture and the maritime industry. In both of those, the people in them know we are not much in control of much of anything. The storms come up and you just make you hanging on to that boat hoping it doesn't fall apart and drown it. And you don't really make the plants grow. We didn't do that. We put the seed in there, but we didn't create the seed. And the rains happen or don't. 
And there's all kinds of stuff. And the two most, as I say, the two most God-fearing occupations are those two. Uh, if you work in an office, you can control the environment, turn the thermostat up or down. You can do all kinds of stuff with, with almost any kind of other work that happens. Um, so one of the things that we wish to help people understand the maritime point of view is to get in a maritime situation and feel the maritime stuff. That means get on a boat out in the James River in this case and go look at the places that you read about in the classroom. They don't even teach history anymore, but probably most everybody in here had history. I think I was one of the last ones that had history in my school. They quit teaching it a couple years after I was there anyway. It wasn't my fault. I didn't tear it up so bad they quit. But, uh, <laughs> I might have. I hated history, by the way. Hated it. Just couldn't stand it. Didn't like the teacher. The teacher didn't like me. I could hardly wait to get out of there. Went to college. Had to take history. Same thing. More of it. Faster. Hated it just as bad. Then I come up here to Colonial Williamsburg and Jamestown. And over a period of years, when I started working at Jamestown, all of a sudden, this history came alive. This isn't some stupid class that somebody wrote about. Dates and generals, dates and generals. You get the general wrong on the wrong side, you flunk the foot. That's what it was to me. But I was a knothead in high school anyway, so even if they told me this stuff, I wouldn't pay attention to it. But uh, I finally, when I came up to Williamsburg, I met some people, and they said, well, why don't you come work with us in the church on Jamestown Island? Oh, Jamestown. No, man, I don't want to that Jamestown. I get so tired of hearing that local people bragging about how their local area is better than everybody else's. They say the same thing about them. We say, no, I, I, said, I just didn't care. But it was Christian, and I was a brand new Christian at that point, 41 years old. So I said, okay, if, I, if I'm working in the church on Jamestown Island, that's the building out there. It's the church. That's really it. Um, so I was assigned to work in that building and talk to people that came in the door about the church and about whatever we said. And our instructions were on a little piece of paper about that big and say, just sort of put your name tag on APVA. You remember the APVA? Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities. That was set up in the 1890s in order to I'll get off track here a little bit. I'll just open that door just a little bit in order to have those people resume their rightful place as the rulers of Virginia. They wanted to get hold of the Jamestown 300 in 1907, and they picked John Smith, the hero, and put those statues up for him down there, and they pumped John Smith, the leader who led these people over here, and saved the place from falling apart. And he got captured because some of his men didn't protect him properly. And they were going to kill him, bash his brains out, poke her put her head on top of his on the rock. So they couldn't kill her, him without killing her. They weren't going to do that. So she's a hero, too. And we've been hearing that. That's what I grew up here. John Smith, the hero. Still is. That's what I was teaching down there, talking to people. But I didn't know any better. Uh, until I got hold of these Virginia Company records. I'm gonna get ahead of myself. It's an exciting story. I'm, I only got three hours to talk up here, so I got to hurry. <laughs> um, anyway, in order for people to appreciate the maritime worldview, it takes something to do to consciously, deliberately make yourself open and thinking like they do. Whether you like it or not, it's a whole other issue. But, and I've had people tell me, but they were wrong. No, they would say, I would, I would tell about them, and they'd say, that's wrong. I said, you mean my, my presentation about them was not accurate? Or it was accurate, but they were wrong in their worldview. Yeah, they were wrong in their worldview, because it's evan evangelical uh, thumping. I say, well, you might be right. Your worldview might be better. But it nevertheless 
they were here and they founded America and we've got the greatest, most free country in the history of mankind that's at risk right now. And but they did that and what country did your worldview found? Nothing. Nothing. So maybe you're right, but you're trading on the foundation they provided. So it's important to understand that foundation, and that's what we're about here. I started out trying to straighten out Jamestown with that John Smith stuff. He wasn't the hero, by the way. I don't want to leave that <laughs> hanging there. Um, he wasn't even hardly mentioned in the Virginia Company records. Um, he was under arrest on the way over here for mutiny or knowing about a mutiny and did not reporting it. And he had a letter from the king to start with said, add this guy to your crew. Well, uh, he didn't have anything to do with setting it up, setting up the ships, recruiting the people, the Virginia Charter, none of that stuff. He just showed up about three weeks before the left said, here, the king says, put me on your crew. So, um, okay. And on the way over, something happened. It's still not totally clear, but he was put in the brig for a mutiny, or for being associated with the mutiny. And when they landed over here at Cape Henry, they went ashore, put up a cross, and had a church service, a little worship service, um, that wasn't pre-written, and it wasn't that everyday annual thing, like the Berkeley thing is. Uh, but he was still aboard ship in the brig. So he didn't lead them ashore, he didn't even participate. When they came up river and started exploring, he was still in the brig. Um, I used to work with Jamestown, as I said, and I did that off and on for, I don't know, about 20 years, I guess. And during that time, a movie company came to Virginia to tell the story like I just basically described it. He was under arrest, he was a, he's a royal agent with secret instructions to keep them from doing away with monarchy and creating a representative government. King James hated that. He hated Parliament. Hated it. And he said, he'd already been told, you keep your eye on the Virginia Company because they're going to do away with monarchy. There and here. So the word is that John Smith was stuck in there and his, his assignment was to prevent that. And uh, he didn't. Uh, but anyway, the, the FFB folks got hold of this story about this company, movie company coming in here, and they literally ran this person out of this commonwealth, physically, hassled him, called him up, called him names, would have shook their fingers in his face, and you do not, blah, 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 whatever. He finally just gave up. He closed up and left. Um, they don't have that kind of power anymore. But they sure did. And uh, we still got the statues at, at Jamestown, but they're not facing each other now. They're in different places. Plus, we got Henricus up here, which upset Jamestown big to have the city of Henricus built. That's competition. And uh, anyway, to get into the worldview, I say get into a boat, get on the river, Go to these places that we talk about that are famous in our history and see it from the same perspective as the first English people who came up the river. And there will be places that, would you go that way or would you go that way? From the land, you can't tell why that's even a decision. In the boat, you sure can tell. And one way is going to lead you nowhere, the other one's going to be the main river. How did they decide that? And sometimes we'll take a cruise and we'll let the, let the pastures. You, we're going to go, you tell me, you know, we're running the boat, but you tell me which way we're going to go. We'll find out, you can find out if you were right or you were whatever. And that's pretty interesting. There's a couple places where the river is pretty uh, steep turn. And one thing we found that was fun to do was to point out that when the English came for the first time up, they didn't know what's around that bend. Might have been nobody. Might have been some friendly people. Might have been some people that shoot you full of arrows too and spear. They didn't know. So we slow the boat down and we go around that bend. 
and you can watch the passengers on the boat, and they kind of, <laughs> kind of, and they're looking around. And they just, now, something I never did, but I've always threatened to do, is to have a group of people around the men <laughs> that would attack the boat. Uh, that would just, <laughs> it, it worked anyhow. It, it was a really a, an important way to see that kind of an issue, to feel it. And I'll give one other example of a cruise that is sort of like that. It's a Civil War thing. You know where Drew's Bluff is? Up the river here? That's kind of the last river portal in the Civil War between the Yankees coming up and Richmond. And the Yankees came up, it's a big bluff. And um, they were running, if they had gotten past Drew's Bluff, they'd have sailed right downtown Richmond and just blasted the capital of the Confederacy to nothing. So it was do or die for the Confederates. And they built the, this was after the Battle of Ironclads, and they took the big naval cannons, put them up on that hill and fired at the ironclads and just tore the Union ironclads to shreds and they went on back down the river and did not attack Richmond. So we go on the river in the boat and you're down there on that boat and you're looking up at that bluff and imagine them shooting at you with those big cannons. So we turn the boat sideways, turn it down to about zero movement and tell that story about how the cannons Balls would come rip through the iron, rip through the wood, splatter, splinters and steel bits all over the crew inside, blow them apart, go through, hit the outside, scatter, and bounce down the river. That's with a big cannon that would bust through the ironclad. And they fought all day long down there with that stuff. And they had body parts and blood, and you kind of put the cannon out there and shoot that, and they couldn't do anything to the brewer's bluff. They just shoot into the side of this big bluff and it didn't hurt anything. Um, the same thing, you put that boat in there and you sit and people say, uh, <clears throat> could, could, could we go somewhere else and talk about this? <laughs> we, you know, we just imagine it being on that boat. Yeah, well, okay. So that's the kind of stuff you can do um, and you can't really do almost any other way. Um, so that's what we're doing, the Maritime Experience Cruising Classroom, we call it. We do not do uh, Margarita cruises, we don't do sunset dinner cruises, we don't do fishing, swimming, recreational boating. This is a cruising classroom, college level, when you get on that boat, class starts. Boom, and we teach you maritime principles, of how you read those channel markers, tides, nav where are you on the world, how do you know where you are on the world? When we went down to Berkeley, we came down to Appomattox, and turn right to go down river. Everybody on the boat that day went, did we just turn, are we going down river or up river? They didn't know. So we helped them figure out how do you know where you are? Are you going up river or down river? It depends on what the tide's doing. The river's flowing that way, sometimes it's flowing this way. That ain't gonna tell you. So that's part of the whole, you know, it's hard to say game, but uh, it's a teaching game. So we do that sort of thing. So um, when uh, I set this up to the General Assembly, they said yes, they commended us for both houses, commended us for this, and we got sponsors from Kerry Corner and uh, Senator Morrissey. And I never met him yet, but I never met her until after she served as the patron, and we went up and she awarded us um, this is the official commendation, that's what it looks like. This is the same thing I just read. This is my version of it. Did I get on eight and a half by 11? I can highlight words, underline, italicize, and this is the way they word it. This is much more impressive, but it's hard to read too. So what I want to do right <coughs> this minute, before I do anything else, is ask Tom Wagstaff to come up here and uh, we want to present a copy of this to the Historic Hopewell Foundation as a thank you, because we got the idea about coming out of here because of this group. So, and I've actually read it because I was there when he was presented his copy of it. <laughs> All right, thank that's, you so much. That's for you if you want to say something. Help and, yeah, uh, I'll be very brief, never brief. Uh, when Kerry presented this to I was there, and it was quite interesting to hear him tell Kerry. Kerry was good.
very, very interested in what he had to say. And you had some Native Americans, sent some Native Americans there. Uh, it was quite interesting. And I can say this, I lived on the James before I moved to Hubwell. Many of you probably passed my house many, many times because it was the, on the north end of the Benjamin Harrison Bridge. The house had a gazebo down the pier. And I can't tell you how many times I take my jet ski, my favorite jet ski ride, was go down to Westover. I thought it was the most beautiful house on the water and ride by Berkeley. So it is right. It is such an entirely different view from the river. My next door neighbor got lost and his wife sent me up to find him, but she sent me the wrong way. He had to beach his jet ski and come up Route 10. And we lived on five. And he had to come up Route 10 to get home. So you can get lost out there if you don't know where you're going. But it is a beautiful, beautiful view from the river. So thank you very much. And we will frame this and put it in. Thank you. Well, I came up here last year. I've been coming through Hopewell for, I don't know, a couple of decades, I guess. You just go through Hopewell. No reason to stop. And then a friend of mine was going to present, I uh, got it on Facebook, he's going to make a presentation. I knew him. And I said, well, I'll go. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. I'll come up. And I walked in and had a crowd like this in here. This whole thing's been going on every week for years. And I just loved it. And I still do. And uh, so I'm pleased this year to be able to share some of what we are doing with the college. We have a copy of this resolution for Berkeley. Also, uh, they could not make it today, and they said, apologies, they just could not work their schedule out to have somebody come and receive it. We dedicated this cruise to Shirley Little Dove Costello McGowan. She's a Mattapani Indian, lives on the Mattapani Reservation over up just above West Point, um, and she passed away last, uh, not quite fall, but summer and fall, and she'd been ill for several years. She was on our board for a long time, and uh, uh, we were going to invite her to take the cruise, and she couldn't do it, so we dedicated the cruise to her, and we went to Delegate Coroner's office. The Madam and I came over. Her two sons came, and the current chief came there also, and she presented the um, resolution to us and we will take a copy of the resolution to the Madison Reservation too. Uh, we really enjoyed that with her. Well, let me point out, I, I have no idea what time it is. Quarter till, I got about another 15 minutes? Okay, I'll have to speed up here. On the outside of the flyer, just look at that, I'll tell you what it is more than talk about each one of it. Uh, our purpose is historical research and continuing education. We offer no degree programs at all. They did not back in the early part of American history, and we don't either, because we're modeling our actions on their actions. Um, and the college was requested by Pocahontas, the real one. She learned, she was quote unquote captured on the Tongue River up there and brought, it's our, we always say brought to Jamestown, but you read the record, they brought her by Jamestown and took her right up past here up to Henricus, which was the capital of Virginia, not Jamestown, Henricus, for five years. That was the capital up here. And while she was there, they taught her how to read from studying the Bible. And the more she got in the Word, the Word got in her. At some point, she said, you know, I believe what I'm reading here. I believe this. Can I be baptized? And they said, yes. That's the whole point of the Virginia Company anyway, is propagating a Christian religion. So they baptized her. And at that point, John Roth, who'd been in love with her for a long time and couldn't do anything about it because she's pagan and he's a Christian and a Christian not supposed to marry somebody that's not a Christian, that's part of the providential stuff, very strong on that. And he was just going nuts. Every time he'd see her, he was in love with her. He, you know, and all of a sudden, he learned, she's a Christian now, baptized. <laughs> so he wrote a letter to the governor proposing marriage to her and permission from the governor and all that. 
and the Indians and the English were one of these times that were right about to fight a group up somewhere. And here comes this courier up with a letter from John Rawls. I, I want to marry Pocahontas. Would you get him? <laughs> He's getting ready to fight for his life, right? And the Indians, his father, her father was over there. And he said, hmm, I wonder what the Indians say about it. So they called a truce, got the letter over with the translator, took it in. And then her father said, okay. <laughs> he said, well, I'm not coming to the wedding. I love y'all and everything, but I don't trust you a bit. I'm not coming over there to the wedding. I'd be too vulnerable. So they did get married, and they had a child and went to England. And she impressed everybody for being a genuine Christian. She was a lady. She was knowledgeable. She's both, you know, a big argument. The Indians were pagan, ignorant, savages. They couldn't, it was too complicated to even understand math or English or religion and that stuff. But she made a show of all that. She understood every bit of that. And she impressed everybody. And while she was there, she asked, would you please set up a college back at my place so my people can learn how to read the Bible the same as I can? And they said, yes. And it took them a couple of years. By the General Assembly in 1619 met, and the first day of their business, they set up this college and set it up here. So that's, um, uh, if you look in the, in the middle part, this is kind of the key of what we do, the Virginia Company records. We found those records. They've been there all that time, and none of the historians looked at them. I wasn't looking for them. I was looking for the Jamestown Charter. I wanted to see why. I knew this much about history. The English had been at war with Spain and France and all kinds, and they were not about to let some jack leg English guy get the ship sail over there and start World War .5 or whatever it would have been. They said, no, I know they wouldn't. I want to see the, the permission. I want to see the, the document. I know there's got to be some kind of record. No, they're all gone. Civil War, we here tore up anything. English Civil War. 200 years earlier than that, you tore up everything, there isn't anything left. So. But I got on a um, crusade almost, and I went to every antiquarian book sale I ever heard of, went to every library, ever went to any bookstore, I went to any, any kind of place that had anything to do with charters and stuff. Okay, do you have the Virginia Charter? I mean the Jamestown Charter. The Jamestown, no, 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 no. I got so tired of hearing no, and I was just about to quit. I said, no wonder if people say they can't find it. Nobody can find it. And I was in the Newport News Library in the reference section, and I was just standing there just about to turn around and leave. So I'm not even going to ask them. They're going to tell me no, do it. I can't stand hearing that anymore. Before I could leave, this nice little lady came up and said, sir, can I help you find something? I almost told her no. Then I said, well, yes, I'm looking for the Jamestown chart. And she cocked her head over, and you could, I could hear her ticking through the files. I could hear it. <laughs> tick, tick, tick. <laughs> she was going through every file they had in that library and every place else she knew of any file. And she finally said, uh, no, we don't have that. I don't know. I've never seen it. I don't know where to tell you to go for it. I, I'm sorry I can't help you with that at all. And I thought, yeah, that's what I thought. I'm not going to look anymore. And before I could turn and leave, she said, however, we do have something called the Virginia Charter, or the Virginia Company Records. Would you be interested in that? My thought was, no, I'm looking for Jamestown. I know Virginia was bigger than it is today, but I don't really care about that. I want to know Jamestown. Well, but I said, okay. So she came over there, came out, and she brought four books out there this size. Four of them. Virginia Company records. I put them, she had to make several trips, bring a pile of them. I said, this is the Virginia Company records? Hi, and I'm working at Jamestown, right? We're the experts on Virginia, right? <laughs> we didn't know anything about this. How come we didn't know anything about it? Because we were looking for the Jamestown charter, not the Virginia charter. And uh, I said, I'll never read this in my rest of my life. But I started flipping through it, and there it is. It's talking about Plymouth, even in the Virginia charter. And it goes on and on and on, and that's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, and we've got a couple of these uh, that are out now. With a friend of mine, took those 
massive 3,000 pages worth of stuff and condensing that into this is his book. It's called Tobacco Corn and Caviar. And I've got a little small handful of them over here for sale if you want to buy them. Uh, the publishing company is out of business. They're not going to be anymore. When these are gone, they're gone. Um, in Rico County Library, bought two of them. Charles City County Library, just bought one. And uh, our local library here just bought one today. Um, so we have those. We've got them in modern day English. It's easy to read and it's full of details. It's just incredible. And with it, Modern day historians talking about the settlers compared to what the settlers said about themselves don't match. In some cases, it's almost the exact opposite. And so what we're doing, since our college was set up in 1619, during that period of time when those Virginia Company records were being written, um, we've made a big deal out of that. And we've made some people awfully mad. I've been fussed at and cussed at about this more than once. And I kind of take that as a sign of pride because they, they're really squalling about it. We said, well, where did you get this from? When you say John Smith, he, we don't find it. He's not in the record like that. That's not who he was. Well, okay, anyway. Um, while I got this here, I'll point out, this is a PhD dissertation on the city of Henricus. In case you've never seen a PhD, that's what one looks like, all right? It's not complicated to read, but it is a lot of reading. And it's got maps in here that show where the first private property in America was, right up the river here. 1616. That's very special. Some countries you can't own property. There are people in this country today that don't want anybody to own property, too. That's a big issue, but it was a huge issue back in those days. The king said, I own everything. The reason you're in your house is because I'm giving you permission to stay there. If I don't give you permission, I'll take and revoke that. You're out. But I got a title. No, you don't. You got a title because I gave you. And they said, you can't do that. Anyway, we had a whole war over this, you know, 1776 and all that. And we've got private property. That's one of the key features of liberty. So anyway, this whole part in the middle back here is about the Virginia Company records, the summary of it some of the main people that were involved in it. And when you read down in there, primary persons, one of them is Smith in Jamestown is marked through Jamestown Charter. And then 1606 Virginia, that's when the charter was written. The Virginia Company was started with that first charter in 1606. That Smith is me. Okay, that's not John Smith. I, I found those charters, I bought them up and we're getting it published learned about. So, American civilization, and I'll just read this, because I, I wrote this in order for it to be said aloud. America was planned and planted in a place with a purpose and a promise and a premise and two precedents and a plethora of perils. It took me months and months to come up with that little thing. I'm just I'm proud, proud of that, where that sound. And if we've got time, we can talk about it. the plan was the charter. It was planted in the continent of Virginia. By the way, when, remember when I said put on, on the shelf what the word Virginia means, among other things? And here's what it meant to them. Can you see? Probably you can see that from back there. 34 and 45 degrees north latitude. Well, unless you're a navigator or something, I'm sure it's just a number, you know. And, uh, but this, anybody know what that is right there? 34 degrees on the East Coast. That's Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Just above Myrtle Beach. Goes clear across to the Pacific Ocean. You know what's over there? Los Angeles. That's the West Coast of Virginia. How do you like that? And this corner up here, 45 degrees, that's halfway between the equator and the North Pole, by the way, right there, is the main Canada border, clear across to about the middle of Oregon. And they claimed in 1606, before they came over here, this is what they claimed for Virginia, named after Queen Elizabeth the Virgin Queen. And most of the explanation, the exploration were going on under her reign, 
So they call this whole thing Virginia. And right there is the Outer Banks. Right there is where we are. If you wave outside this door, satellite will pick you up. We're right there. You come on up the river and you can see Long Island. You can't see it from there probably, but it's almost east and west. And that little hook sticking out, can you, you know what that is? Cape Cod. Yeah. Who landed in Cape Cod? The Pilgrims in Northern Virginia. <laughs> and they said that in the Mayflower Compact. That shook me up. I was already to fight with them about that. Shoot, y'all already said that. Well, they were lost. They didn't know where they were. And now they thought they were in the northern part of Virginia, but they really were outside it. And blah, 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 blah. no, they knew where they were. They knew exactly where they were. And the Mayflower was a Virginia company ship. And the people that got their permission to come out of Holland and come over here and recruited them was a Virginia company, which had responsibility for this whole thing. So it's not like us here giving them permission. It was the council in England. That's the headquarters. They didn't come here. They sent people here. That's a key feature to, to know. Okay, anyway, at the very bottom of there, I put up a challenge to all living history museums. And I worked at uh, Jamestown on the island. I worked uh, I on a board member with the city of Henricus. And I worked for Colonial Weisberg twice. So this is all those. And I didn't work at Plymouth, but it, I include them as a living history museum. Without the primary sources, Virginia Company records, are you history-themed amusement parks? A lot of them, that's about what it amounts to. It's a history-themed amusement. You go and you take a day out of school, hey, you go down here and play and have fun. And you don't learn about private property, you don't learn about the college, you don't learn about the Virginia Charter, you don't learn any of that kind of stuff. You just have a good time when you go down there. Are you an agenda-driven progressive propagandist? Propaganda pit, I didn't have room to put pit on there. Some of them, that's exactly what they are. Or Virginia chauvinist, if we say we're better than, they, than Plymouth because we were first. Or you pick pilgrim idolaters. They hate me to call them idolaters, but that's what they do. And uh, so I'm about to run out of time here, so. Let me stop and open. The last thing I'll say is this on the back flap is the times and stuff that we did going to the General Assembly. And I put the HB, you know, the House bill or House Joint bill or Senate bill. And, and I didn't have room to put the, the papers and all that, but we've got all those. We've got some of them over here on this table. Um, we're not really in the book sale business, but we got some stuff for sale. And uh, one of them is, uh, I'll say this, she wouldn't have known. The South Carolina House representatives picked up on one of our things up here and repeated it and said a high five to Virginia General Assembly for saying that 1606 charter is the birth certificate of American civilization. And I didn't even ask them that. They did it anyway, so there's a copy of that. Um, you've got a copy of the most recent one. Um, this is the copy of the very first one we did, 2006. And uh, first 18 years of America. This is a copy of the state law that requires public schools to teach the three charters of Virginia. They don't do it very well, but this is state law and a flyer about us. And we, we sell each one of these at two bucks a page. Um, and I'll say this last thing and then we'll stop. This is a little booklet of the five great documents of liberty. The Magna Carta. We go back to the Magna Carta. And I maintain that America goes back to the Magna Carta. We don't go to the uh, Greco Roman and the Roman Republic and the Greece democracy. They had something. They had a republic, but it's not our republic. Ours comes out of the Magna Carta. And you can follow the ideas in that and follow them up through the Virginia Charter, which is specifically is us here, and gave you that territory. And in England, they had the Petition of Right, where they called up the king, and they get your people back under the law, your ministers under the law. And I, I'll say this, but the ministers, the king had 
And it turns out they call him Minister of the Interior, Minister of Defense, Minister of the Exchequer. We call him Secretary of Defense. Secretary. We, that's when we fought the American Revolution. We dropped that Minister of, of, the, of the Godly stuff. That's the Creator. The Creator is the state. The Redeemer is the church. That's providential stuff right there. And then they had the English Bill of Rights, which is the model for ours, 100 years before ours. And then the Declaration of Independence, which is the same set of stuff. That's a Christian document, and there's nothing in there about salvation at all. Nothing. And some evangelicals would get all mad and say, well, that's not a Christian document. That's something to go. We're not under the law. We're, that's the law. We're not under the law. You talk about the temple law. But uh, we obey the laws, traffic laws. That's not a good example. We don't, <laughs> we don't obey them all that well. But, um, and then the United States Constitution is based on the ideas in these five documents. So this is primary source for them in modern day English. And uh, if you want to argue with people about what, what the Constitution means, then you got it. So we put this together. I'll take credit for putting this one together. We'll sell that to you for 10 bucks today while I'm here. Um, I'll mention this little book, The First 17 Years of Virginia. Now, I'm going to read you the first, first sentence in here. This is a famous little book, Charles Hatton, well-written book, nice book, came out in 1957. On May 13, 1607, three small English ships approached Jamestown Island in Virginia. He starts off after they got here. That's what all these guys did. They start off after the people came here. And I'm saying they didn't start here. It started in England with that charter. They, they weren't over here yet when they did this. And they did all kinds of other stuff. So we call our booklet, the book that I wrote called The First 18 Years. I backed it up a year and included the beginning. And that includes Plymouth, too. Like I say, you know, this, this is where the pilgrim planted. And preserving the Old Dominion, if you ever want to read a book about how John Smith got to be the hero, this is in there. This is, he taught, this is the William and Mary graduate. He talks about how they picked John Smith out of all the people possible and created a whole organization around it. And it was a white racist thing. He said, makes it very clear. They put it in the paper, the Richmond paper. They, did, they were open about it. They thought this was true. And... Uh, so there's a story behind John Smith's statue and why he's whatever he was. And, uh, and I'll stop right there, except to say this is a Facebook. Uh, my picture's on Facebook. I paid them 100 bucks, and they put them all together in the book. And right here's our first board. And right there's Shirley Little Dove. And uh, it's Ann Cochran. Steve Petrain is in here somewhere. I saw him a while ago, right there. He was on our board originally, and uh, several other people. And this is a fascinating little book. I didn't know what they were going to do. They chose this, this is the front picture. So it took me a while to say it. I'm going to quit right there. And uh, obviously, I like the topic now. And uh, I'll be over the table for a while if you want to look at the stuff. Or, I'd say $2 per page, $10 for the five great documents, $50 that $125 book on the big one uh, because we're here and I don't have to mess with shipping and labeling and the postage and all that kind of stuff. I just sell it to you. Normally it's $125 bucks retail. But today I can get $50. All right, so I'm going to stop right here. Wow. Oh, this is